but I think um, you know, I managed to get up eight points to highlight why Malaysia needs a, you know, a fresh look. I think one is that the political uncertainty seems to be over, as Prime Minister highlighted. Uh, the Pakatan coalition with the government has two thirds of the majority. So we haven't this, this kind of wide margin by quite a while. And there's essentially four years of runway now to undertake the reforms. Right? Um, so I think you know, there's room to do some of bold stuff that previous governments were reluctant to, including the rationalization of the fuel subsidies. Right? Two, inflation is under control. As highlighted many times, headline inflation 2%, right? Core inflation about 2.8%. And I think credit for Bank Nagar for you know, bringing inflation under control. We think that um, rate hikes are over. So there's you know, space there for, for you know, markets to at least uh, be, be happy that the policy rate will stay around 3% for this year and next year. I think the point is about the public debt and uh, fiscal deficit ratios, and you know, dramatically high during the pandemics, down to about 5%. And we've heard many times that there will be a Fiscal Responsibility Act that will be coming out that will set goals on the fiscal deficit, the debt level, the servicing, as well as government guarantees and committed liabilities. And the Ministry of Finance will be answerable to the Parliament for deviations. I think the bottom line is that we hope there will be more fiscal discipline, more checks and balances, and there won't be any more 1MDBs. Right? I mean, I think that's the bottom line. Um, I actually went to the numbers just to check how the revenue is doing in the first six months of the year. Pretty encouraging, it's up 18% actually for the first seven months. So it's running above well, projections. Shows that the reopening and recovery is delivering on the revenue side. So I won't be surprised if the fiscal deficit turns out to be slightly better than expected. After four, as we you know, several times, as Dr. Omar highlighted, the asset valuations are pretty cheap. Uh, we have our own strategies. They think that the PE levels are currently at trading at 13 times. That's about one and a half times standard deviation below the average about 16 times. Dividends yield on average is about 4.3%. You know, that's, that's pretty decent. Five, the ringgit. Is it fundamentally undervalued? Well, I took a look at the IMF models. There are a couple of models. Most would put a premium on the current account surplus that Malaysia has. But essentially, the undervaluation is by as much as 7% to as much as 25%. You know, so that's, you know, so it depends what you believe. But if you take the more conservative 7%, that puts the ringgit at about 435 versus the 468 uh, current valuation. But maybe the best way to find out how cheap and inexpensive Malaysia is to, re is re to really visit. Because I think one night at the Sofitel uh, could spend about seven nights in a, in a five-star hotel in a Marriott or you know, a Ritz-Carlton with breakfast included. So <laughs> and I think for, for an investor, I think with the US dollar being so strong, and we all know that the Fed is pretty much near the end of the tightening cycle, it's probably a sensible strategy to start looking at uh, emerging market currencies. You know, they're probably going to start rallying when the Fed cuts sometime next year. Six, the EPF, you know, I think we mentioned, big depletion during the pandemic years, 140 billion ringgit of savings drawn down. Well, the good news is that that, that policy of withdrawals has stopped, right? When you look at the EPF contributions, it's up about 17% in the first six months of this year. And the EPF is once again, you know, omnipresent, it's the big buyers of government bonds. It bought about 40% of government bonds this year in the first half, higher than 30% in the last two years. And of course, it was a net seller during the heart of the pandemic 2020. The EPF is always deploying funds back into, into the stock market. So it's a big you know, supporter of funds. My bond market FX strategies would tell me that a US dollar hedge MGS yield could give an investor about 150 basis point pickup. Um, so that a three year FX hedge MGS yield is the most 6%. You know, that's about 150 basis points above the US you know, equivalent um, two year. Sounds pretty attractive to me on, on that part. Last two reasons, seven, I think it's just um, a key function of what's happening in terms of US-China geopolitical rivalry. Manufacturing supply chains are moving to ASEAN, particularly to the, map, to the ASEAN manufacturing four, you know, essentially Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. So when we look at the numbers, it's pretty stunning, because when you look at the FDI jump in Malaysia, it's tripled 
over what it was you know, during the pre-pandemic years. And this year, in the first half, it looks like it may even top last year's numbers, um, reaching almost essentially about 260 billion ringgit, roughly about 55 billion US. That's, that's more than 10% of, of uh, Malaysia's GDP, which is remarkable. It's just that it's not showing up in the, in the investment growth yet for Malaysia. But if you know that this, this investments are going to show up, I think potential growth can go up usually half to one percentage points a year. Um, so that's, that's, that's quite a bit. And I think as Prime Minister Halet, Malaysia is not aligned to any sides, right? You know, we are fiercely independent. Um, and it's just not US and China, because when you look at the numbers, it's investments coming from Singapore, I think for some reason cited. It's coming from the allies. Um, Japan has a southbound policy where it gives subsidies to Japanese, Japanese MNCs to move into ASEAN. Korea has the same policy, right? So you got, you know, ASEAN is becoming like a conduit, uh, a big area that's sucking a lot of investments because of these walls essentially happening between US and China. So I think it's up to Malaysia to really seize the moment. And the new National Industrial Master Plan will provide a roadmap for how the corporate sector to plan and invest. There are, there was a question about you know, savings, deployment. I think there are incentives being done to attract the private savings pool, including probably what we announced in budget, interest rate subsidies, and a national co-investment fund as well. Eighth reason is the whole green transition, right? That's the big thing that's happening. The new energy transition roadmap targets a mix of 70% renewable mix by 2050. That's pretty ambitious. And that itself is sparking new opportunities and investments. I'm based in Singapore, so I can see you know, that's going to be a big shakeup. Um, Singapore has set incredibly high targets. Singapore can afford to buy it, and it will pay up for it. Um, the carbon tax is going to go up come first gen actually by 500%, $5 to $25. Then it's going in two years' time to $40. By the end of the decade, it's going to be about $80. That's a pretty steep climb. I'm going to be paying it through my electricity bills. But essentially, Singapore, only 5% is coming from renewables. So it's got to buy it from the region. And I think as highlighted, you know, renewable energy is actually inherently geographic. You need to get it from the region because so much is lost in the transmission. Um, so Singapore is going to be buying from Niger in terms of the solar. It's going to be buying from Malaysia, hydro, you know, um, from um, hydrogen from uh, Sarawak, and, and of course, um, you know, from Laos as well, right? Hydroelectric power. So that's, that opens up a whole new landscape. Um, Malaysia, fortunately, has relaxed export renewables into Singapore. Um, so that's a, big, that's a big move. There was a question asked about ASEAN cooperation and so on. Actually, the best example of this is actually the ASEAN power grid, because you need it now, you know? Because if you want to sell, produce, and share, and distribute the renewable energy, you need a working ASEAN power grid and there'll be investments to, to expand that power grid. Um, I come from the town of Jobaru, which is right across from Singapore, and you can see yeah, a, a lot more excitement that's going on. A lot of the investments are spilling over from Singapore. Um, Singapore can't handle any more data centers, for example, because it's too much of an energy guzzler. So all those investments are moving to Johor Iskanda, uh, as an example. So let me wrap the, I think, uh, quoting Prime Minister. Um, Malaysia's economy is at a key pivot point. Is making bold strategic and structural reforms to strengthen the fiscal balance sheet, transform the manufacturing sector, and accelerate the shift towards renewables. And the global winds of change is blowing in Malaysia's favor. Supply chains are moving away from China. Uh, China is huge, you know, so even a little small move, I think, makes a lot of difference to the rest of the region. And of course, Singapore and you know, the countries, and the MNCs themselves are demanding clean energy, the ones they're moving in, right? Day one, clean energy, and they're not gonna take it, you know, supplying it from coal and so on. So that's forcing, I think, new investment opportunities um, all across the region. Thank you for joining us at Invest Malaysia today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chua.